Okay, it is 8 p.m. in the East Coast of the United States. It is 8 a.m. in China. And uh, it is 5 p.m., I guess, in the West Coast of the United States. And we are going to start our lecture about, well, probably one of the most wonderful uh, books written for both uh, children and adults, uh, The Little Prince. Uh, the Little Prince was written by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, uh, a, uh, French, a Frenchman uh, who was uh, not only an author, not only did he write books and short stories and articles and things like that, but he was a pilot. He was also a pilot. And he was uh, not only a pilot, but he was an adventurer type of a pilot. He wasn't just a pilot. He wasn't like one of these pilots that goes to work in the morning and he goes to the airport and he gets inside of a 747 and and he flies a bunch of people from one city to another and uh, you know a pilot that has a nine to five sort of a job uh, not that those jobs are not important of course they are they're very important but he was a different type of a pilot he was an adventurer he did really crazy wild stuff while he was flying his plane. Uh, and, but in, on top of that, on top of the fact that he was a pilot, he was, he was also an author. And he wrote uh, many uh, wonderful stories about flying, about adventures. That's what he liked. He liked adventures. And uh, he wrote this uh, story, The Little Prince, which has really struck a certain appeal with many people, people who have read the book. Uh, they come out feeling really good. They come out seeing the world from a different perspective from a different point of view. Uh, when you read the book, if you're an adult, you realize that a lot of the things that we adults worry about are really not that important. Uh, there are many other things that are much more important. Love, companionship, trust, uh, Dreams, dreams, to have dreams. Um, so, uh, so let's take a look at, uh, at this wonderful book. I usually like to start all of my lessons, all of my lectures by uh, taking a look at the author, uh, him or her regardless of whether it's a, a woman author or, or a male author. Uh, but I like to look at the author and sort of get inside of the, the author's mind as to why uh, he or she wrote the book, number one. Understand where the person is from, the historical uh, input or the historical circumstances uh, under which he wrote the book, he or she wrote the book. Because we, we really like to, in order for us to really understand the book, and, and these classes are about taking a deep dive into, into each of the books that we analyze. It's not just reading the book, because I could sit here and read the book to you, um, and, uh, and not explain anything. And yeah, you would enjoy it. Uh, you would enjoy it as much as if you were to grab the book and read it. But uh, 
But I believe in not just reading the words in a book. Uh, I believe in to looking deeper into the book and looking at the author, looking at the historical context of when the book was written and why, why did the author uh, write what he, what he wrote, what he did indeed write. So anyway, so uh, his name, his real name, his registered name when he was born uh, was Antoine Marie Jean Baptiste Roger Comte de Saint Exupéry. Wow, what a name, what a huge name, right? What a huge name. Um, and you can, I can explain to you each and every bit of that name. Um, back uh, in, well, actually in many of the, what's considered to be romance countries. Romance countries mean countries that were, whose, whose language directly uh, comes from Rome, and that's where the word Roman, romance comes from. Um, French is a derivative of Latin. Spanish is a derivative of Latin. Italian is a derivative of Latin. And Latin is the language that was spoken in Rome many, many years ago, you know. Uh, 2,000 years ago. Even uh, the language that they speak in Romania, Romanian is a Romance language. Um, and in these countries, uh, people, especially those who are Catholic, um, they give a lot of names to their children because each name represents a member of the family going back in time. Uh, so if you look at uh, in Spain, for instance, uh, in some of the very traditional, and people don't do this so much anymore, uh, but back when the Catholic Church was very, very powerful in Spain, uh, it was not uncommon for people to have a first name a middle name, a middle, middle name. In other words, another name, a last name, the last name of the father, the last name of the mother, the last name of the father's mother, the last name of the mother's, uh, mother's mother. So in other words, you would see names that would be Juan Martin Josefo, De Gonzalez Martinez Rodriguez La Guardia, you know, and so on and so on. And and you would see someone with a name that would be just huge. And uh, and it was a way of identifying children, first of all, children that came from families that were a little bit more prominent and they had uh, uh how do you call it? Uh they had, uh, they were proud of their heritage, right? They were proud of their heritage. Um, but it was also as a way of being, making sure, because last names were kind of similar. You know, there would, there would be a lot of people with the last name Martinez, let's say, right? There would be a lot of people with the same name Rodriguez. But if you say Martinez Rodriguez de la Guardia, then now that narrows the scope a little bit and, and you can be identified uh, belonging to your family a little bit better. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of the Catholic, very traditional Catholic families in both Fran uh, France, Italy, Spain um, would, uh, would carry so many names. But there's another Interest, interesting 
I'll name in here Comte. Comte Antoine Marie Jean Baptiste Roger Comte de Saint Exupéry. And Comte means count. Count. An account is a someone who was conferred that title by the monarchy, by the king or the queen. And these are usually very prominent families. Families who at one time performed a service to the king or the queen. In France, uh, England had other methods of, uh, of showing this sort of titles that would make a person or a family be well known. But if you performed a, 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 a service or did something for the monarchy, the monarchy, the king would assign uh, your family and you with a royal, quote unquote, with a royal title, with a royal title. And that's what uh, he carried that title, his, uh, perhaps his father or mother, most likely his father or maybe his grandfather was uh, made a count and then the children that are born from there, you know, the children and grandchildren, they carry that title with them. Uh, today, in the 21st century, you're not going to see too many people either bragging or showing a title unless they're doing it for either political reasons or perhaps someone who is in academia, academia meaning teaching at a big university, uh, someone with a very prestigious job and they want to show off or they want to show that their family is an old, you know, family, family that had been associated with past kings and queens. Um, and then they would, they would probably either show the title or name themselves, you know, when they identify themselves, they would identify themselves with that title. Um, so you don't really see it that much anymore. And not only that, as the years have gone by in France, the monarchy, the monarchy meaning the family of kings and queens that ran the country, uh, the monarchy is farther from people's minds because years have gone by. And France has been a democracy for many years, meaning, uh, a government that does not uh, answer to a king or a queen. You know, they have a prime minister, they have uh, different members of, you know, the parliament and uh, they're elected by the people. Uh, so they no longer, if you talk to most, most French people, while they might know, of course, they're gonna know the history of their country. They don't think of their country as even an ex-monarchy, you know. They, they, you know, so this is pretty much gone from people's minds. Um, but uh, Antoine uh, de Saint Exupéry, uh, he was born in Lyon. Lyon, Lyon is a very well-known city in, Fran in France, uh, and he was born to an aristocratic Catholic family. Uh, that could trace its lineage back several centuries. Uh, probably in their uh, family vault, they would have some sort of a genealogical uh, document saying, you know, Antoine was the son of such and such, who was the son of such and such, who was the son of this one and that one and that one and that one. And, you know, and it goes back to the 14th century and, you know, in 1472, uh, 
this particular person was named a count by, you know, King Louis the Twelfth or something, you know. So it's 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 aristocratic. Aristocratic means that you are uh, of. Uh, in some countries, they call it blue blood. Blue blood meaning that you're either related to or in very close relationship with the, you know, with the members of the monarchy of the kingdom of the king and the queen and the princesses and, and all of that stuff. Um, the Saint Exuberi, he was quite the, quite the character. Um, the more I read about him, the more I, uh, I kind of say, wow, he was, uh, no wonder people really loved him uh, because uh, we always have a certain degree of admiration for number one, pioneers, people that do something first, the first one to do something. Uh, we also have a lot of admiration for smart people. You know, we like smart people. Uh, we like people that express themselves very well. Uh, we, we like people that are adventurers. You know, we, we always admire adventurers. We, we admire people that, uh, that take a risk. They put their lives on the line to accomplish something that eventually is good for society as a whole. And back, you know, at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, when aviation, when uh, uh, airplanes were becoming more and more popular, uh, people saw uh, aviation as uh, the next frontier, right? The next frontier. And we always have frontiers, right? So the next frontier after aviation was traveling in outer space and you know, and we're still dealing with that frontier. That is still one of the frontiers that we're looking at. The medical frontier, you know, the communications frontier. So we were, all, we've always been dealing with these things that we consider to be the next frontier, the thing that we want to reach, that we want to accomplish. And he was right there. He was right there in the midst of the, uh, of this endeavor, of the endeavor of flying. And people looked up to aviators as, uh, as heroes, as adventurers, uh, you know, someone that would put his or her life on the line to advance science because aviation is a science. So he was, he was a pioneer aviator. He was also an author. He was a poet, an aristocrat. Well, you know, a lot of people don't care nowadays anyway that he was an aristocrat. Uh, he was a journalist. And he was a literary laureate. In other words, he was given awards by, the, by various governments, uh, the French government, the American, the U.S. government, and other governments uh, for his literary accomplishments, for his literary accomplishments. And that's what the word laureate means. A laureate is someone who receives an award, a prestigious award, by the way, because I can receive an award for playing tennis at my club, but it doesn't make me a laureate. It just makes me someone that can hit a backhand pretty good, you know, pretty well. It makes me someone that can play tennis pretty well. Uh, so, but I'm not a laureate. But a laureate, you know, that's given to, to people that win the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize in Literature, the Nobel Prize in Science and Chemistry, you know, in the medical, in the medical profession and so forth. So a laureate, is someone that receives a prestigious, prestigious award. Um, 
he, oops, sorry. Let me get rid of this thing here. Uh, Iris out to please anybody who has a show to talk about. All right. Um, he wrote extensively about flying. He wrote extensively about flying and adventures, about love, about friendship, about death and about heroism. Uh, he saw heroism, which is the act of being a hero, as something noble, as something uh, beyond normal existence, something noble, some, something that only those people of noble heart, of pure, heart would do. They would sacrifice themselves if need be for some higher uh, goal, you know, for a goal that to defeat an evil en enemy like France was fighting at the time against Hitler in Germany at the time that he wrote this book. Uh, or to, uh, to do anything, to advance medicine, to, to advance goodness for people. And that's what a hero is. And he believed in heroism. He believed in it. He believed that he would give up his life at any time if it meant uh, to advance uh, goodness. Throughout his lifetime, he was involved in several crashes. And that is true. I mean, he crashed more planes than you could possibly imagine. Um, over here, we see him, uh, first of all, in the crash of, a, of an airplane. He was flying. I think he was flying this plane from Vietnam to Paris, from Paris to Vietnam on a race. This was a race. Back in those days, uh, as I say, planes, airplanes were were kind of, they were still rudimentary, not like today, you know. Today we got super fast jets and, and we got huge planes that carry, you know, 400 passengers and uh, huge planes that carry cargo. You know, they can carry cargo as much cargo as uh, more, much more cargo than a truck. Um, and, uh, but back then, you know, planes were sort of like, they weren't very safe, first of all. A lot of crashes. There were a lot of crashes all the time. And as a way to advance the science of aviation, uh, different countries would organize uh, races. They would organize a race. And, uh, and different companies, different manufacturers, would build their best airplane, their best airplane. And they would use these best airplanes to test them, number one, and for advertising purpose. Because if someone who had developed some sort of a plane, that plane could win a race, then people, companies that needed to buy planes would go to that company to acquire a plane. So he got involved in, in several of these races. And in this one particular occasion, he crashed it in the Sahara Desert, which by the way, is the beginning, is the reason why he wrote, he used that experience to write this wonderful novella. Novella, remember that, novella, N-O-V-E-L-L-A. This is not a novel. This is a novella, novella. And a novella says that it's a short novel. A novella is a short novel. So in other words, if you were to look at the five or six different sizes of writing, of fiction or nonfiction, you can say that the smallest, the littlest 
fiction that you can write is called a flash fiction. Flash, like flash. Like you take a flash from a camera and you go poof. And they call it a flash fiction because it's really, really quick. Maybe a page and a half. And the writer has to be really good to write a flash fiction because the writer must, he or she, must start the, the fiction, develop the plot, and finish it within a page and a half or two pages. And it's got to be something that satisfies the reader. Then the next size up is a short story. And a short story is, uh, you know, anywhere from four or five pages up to maybe 10 pages. But that's it. Now, a short story has the same challenges as a flash fiction in that uh, you have to start the fiction and conclude it, create the plot and finish it very quickly. You don't have the advantage of writing a whole book that gives you plenty of time to develop a plot or to develop, you know, something. And then the next size up, this would be the third size, uh, is a novella. And a novella typically has about 60 or 70 pages. And many authors like writing novellas. For instance, Ernest Hemingway in The uh, Old Man and the Sea. That's a novella. It's 72 pages. <laughs> and this one. Uh, the Little Prince, it's a novella, which is, I don't know, I've got to check it, but I think it's like 68 or 69 pages. Um, so many, many authors like writing novellas. They like writing novellas because they don't want to, they don't want to write too much. They have a story in their minds, which is, can be quickly told. And if you go on and on and on and on, they feel that, you know, the, the piece that they're writing loses effectiveness. So they want to start it, they want to develop the plot, they want to finish it quickly. So they write about 70 pages. And then the next level up is a novel, right? And a novel, we know the novels, uh, anything from, you know, The Lord of the Rings to uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the, the, the hounds of the Baskervilles and, you know, and so forth and so on. And usually a novel has about 300, uh, 350, 400 pages. Uh, Charles Dickens uh, wrote little longer novels. Uh, for instance, Oliver Twist, which is one of the classes that I'm teaching this uh, particular session. That novel had about 600 and some are 650 pages. So it's a little bit longer. And then you have an epic, an epic, E-P-I-C, epic novel. And an epic novel is huge. An epic novel would be uh, either, either an epic novel or an epic poem. Uh, you know, they, they can be a thousand pages or more. They can be a thousand pages or more. But in the case of uh, The Little Prince, The Little Prince is a novella. I repeat, a novella, N-O-V-E-L-L-A, L-L-A. -L -L -A. So remember that, because you're going to hear that term a lot. You're going to hear that whenever you're reading about something or someone, they're going to say, well, this is a novella. Uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, Saint Exupéry is uh, showing Joan in front of his war plane, uh, the P-38. This is the plane in which he crashed and died. Um, he volunteered to fly against the Nazis, and uh, it was a fateful. Uh, yes, say again. Can I couldn't hear you? Did he really die? Yes. Oh, yes. He died. He died in a in a plane crash. Uh, then why? Then why did he fight against the Nazi? I'm I'm having a hard time hearing you. I, I don't know why. Well, okay. So if if he was dead, why? Then how could he fight 
than the Nazis? Well, he was he was flying against the Nazis when when he died. He joined the Air Force. He joined the French Air Force, uh, okay. and he started flying reconnaissance flights. Is it kind of like, like, kinda like they killed each other? Like Nazis killed him, and then they... no, no, he he actually died in a, in a in an accident. Oh. He wasn't shot down. He, oh. you'll see, you'll see. Wait, hang in there, hang in there. I'm glad, I'm glad you interrupted me and asked me. That's fine. Any one of you who want to jump in and you have a, a good question to ask, go ahead, ask it. Yeah. So, if you, is he super bad at flying a plane? No, 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 his plane just broke down. Um, you know, remember that I said that back in those days, you know, planes weren't really all that good. They, they would and break also, down. Yeah. did he crash more than Hemingway? Oh, did he crash more than Hemingway? Yes, he did. By far. First of all, Hemingway crashed twice. One day, one right but, after the other. But he crashed three times, though. Oh, he, this guy here, he crashed a bunch of times. Oh, yeah. He was, he was just three, test just pilot. Pictures. You're, you're going to see. It. Hang in there. Crash, all crash. of that is going to come out in the presentation. But how, did he, um, but how did he survive for all those crashes? Well, because he, he was lucky. <laughs> He was lucky. In this yeah. one here in the middle, see this Colin picture here the in the middle? Colin, Colin the see? Lucky man. Yeah, hold on. You see this picture here in the middle? This is when he crashed in the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert is like one huge flat piece of land. So his plane, uh, the engine busted. And he was able to glide. You know what gliding is? Going real slowly know, like this? Like, Whee! Is Whee! it sliding? Yeah, he glided and then and he landed. Until it, until it just crashed. Like right, there you go. So he glided and then he landed and he survived. He was lucky. Actually, he could have died of heat in the desert, not having water. And you're going to see, you're going to see all of that. Let's move on. Let's move on. Here, here's more information for you. On the on the December 30th, because he crashed so many times, but you can also say he's lucky because he survived. He survived a lot of times. That's right. He was so lucky. Is he unlucky or lucky? Well, he was unlucky the day he died. Yeah, I was like, yep. Um, is there parachutes in the airplane? What's that? Uh, well. Is yes, there a parachute in the airplane? Uh, no. Uh, no, he no. did not. <laughs> no, he no. did so not have a parachute. So he did then, not. And then he just fall off. And, ah, yeah. Okay, shut down, shut down your mic so that I can continue with the, with the class. You're going to see all of that. Okay. I'm going to cover everything for you. I'm going to give you every little bit of detail. Okay. Okay, so hang in there. All right. So anyway, so on December 30th, 1935, at 2.45 a.m., after 19 hours and 44 minutes in the air, get a hold of that, 19 hours flying. Whoa. Yeah, Sainik Superi, along with his mechanic <laughs> navigator, Andre Prevost, crashed Crash. in the Libyan desert. Why is there another man over there? Close, close. Shut down your mic. Oh. Show down your mic, only open it if you're going to ask a question. <laughs> okay, anyway, so with his mechanic, Andre Prevost, he crashed in the Libyan desert. He was attempting to break the speed record in a Paris to Saigon, Vietnam. Remember, I told you he was going to Vietnam. In a Paris to Saigon, Vietnam air race and win a prize of 150,000 francs. 150,000 francs back in those days was quite a bit of money. It was only maybe like, I don't know, maybe $5,000. But back then it was a lot of money. The pair had only one day's worth of fluids, one day worth of water. That's all you had. And they thought he was going to die. They were going to die. Uh, but on the fourth day, a Bedouin, a Bedouin is a tribe. See these guys here? These guys are Bedouins. They're Bedouins, Bedouins. That's what they're called. And these are desert people. 
Bedoin, they know the desert really well. Uh, they're kind of nomads. A nomad is someone who travels through the desert. And uh, they found them and they gave him some liquids. They gave him stuff so that he would rehydrate himself and not die. So these guys saved, saved him. Now, when he crashed his plane, you know, he had a camera and he managed to take a picture. This is Andre Prevot, Prevot. This is Andre Prevot. This is his mechanic navigator. So he took a picture of his mechanic navigator and his plane. This was the plane they were flying. And he, uh, and then he developed, because back then it was film, you know. He developed it once. A person can live without water for three days, and that's exactly three days for one day. Right. Just, yeah, they, he, they were lucky days. that they had water for one day. So they then did. they only had to survive for two days without water. Yeah, and then it's lucky three again. days. I found them. Yeah, if they didn't, if he didn't find those people, he would have been dead. Yeah. Okay, shut down, shut down your mics. Okay, so here we go. Um, in April 1943, following his 27 months in North America, Senek Superi departed with an American military convoy for Algiers to fly with the French, the Free French Air Force and fight with the Allies in the Mediterranean-based squadron. He was eight years older than all the other pilots that fought in the war. Senek Superi's last assigned reconnaissance mission was to collect intelligence on German troops' movements in and, in and around the Rhone Valley preceding the Allied invasion of southern France, up, which was called Operation Dragoon. Um, on the 31st of July, 1944, he took off in an unarmed, no weapons, P-38, right here. This is a P-38. On his ninth reconnaissance mission from an air base in Corsica, Corsica is a little island off the coast of uh, France. To the great alarm of the squadron com uh, compatriots who revered him, they revered him, meaning they loved him, they just loved him, uh, he, he vanished. He vanished without a trace. He vanished without a trace. He just disappeared, never to be found. Well, they found him later. Uh, but uh, they realized that something happened to his plane. Either the engine broke and he didn't have any more power and he, you know, crashed into the ocean or something like that. Um, but, you know, he was so loved and famous in France that after his death, and this is before the uh, France adopted the, uh, the euro, you know, the euro money, um, the French franc had his portrait on it. The 50 uh, franc currency had his, actually had his portrait on it, had his portrait with uh, the little prince on it. That's how much the, they loved him. That's how much they loved him. That's how much he is loved in France. He's loved in France because of his philosophical approach to life you know, this approach of being a hero, of loving people, of uh, being in touch with his emotions and all that stuff, they, they love him. They just really love him. In fact, he is so loved all over the world that in Japan, in, ha in Hakone, Japan, there's actually a museum made out to the little prince. And here's the museum right here. And as you can see, this statue has the little prince on top of the asteroid, on top of one of the worlds rather than that he visited well, when the little the prince little was, prince. Uh, was going the, on. But that's not the little prince, it's the lamplighter. Yeah, it could be it could be one of the characters from the from the little prince. I've never been there, so I don't know. I think it's the that's right, it's the lamplighter. This is the lamplighter. You're right. You're totally correct. Very observant. Um, this is the facade. Hold on a second, guys. Hey, Yvonne, I got clothing in there. You, wanna, you might want to take it out. 
sorry. Uh, this is the facade of the Antoine de Saint Exupery Museum in Morocco. Morocco is on the northern part of uh, Africa. So there's another museum to him that was erected, that was built in his uh, memory, in his memory. And then in France, of course, uh, there is a, a section in the French Air and Space Museum dedicated to him of all his accomplishments, all the times that he crashed, all the times that he flew experimental planes and all this stuff. He, he's, you know, uh, the Saint Exupery was, he was a hero. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, there's another monument in Tarfaya Cape, uh, Juby, Morocco, commemorating Aeropost uh, Stale, uh, Stale's uh, mail stopover station and St. Exupery, who was its manager. He would actually, for a while, he would deliver mail. This is back when, you know, mail delivery was very important. Uh, before airplanes, mail had to go on a ship and it would take months to cross the ocean and get to the person that was to receive the mail. But then when planes were invented, you know, mail could go from one country to another or from one, one part of one country to another within hours or days, you know, really saving a lot of time. So he would fly from France with mail in his plane, in his biplane. This is one of the biplanes that he would fly, a uh, very antiquated, very old plane. And he would land on the desert he would give the mail to the mail station and then the mail station would deliver it to the people to whom the mail was intended to whom the mail. So he was, he did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of stuff in aviation. Um, in Quebec, he lived in Quebec for a little while. There's a plaque uh, to his uh, life, you know, made out to his life, made out to his life. Um, so this is the historical plaque right here. I don't know. My French is not that good. Um, the people of Quebec, uh, commemorate, uh, Sir Jordan. I don't know what that means. Uh, 1942, Dans la Famille de Kovinec, uh, with the family of the Kovinec and then you know his name and the day he died and stuff like that so uh, anyway here's another one here's another plaque commemorating his life it says a memory of Antoine de saint exupery poet novelist aviator disappeared during an aerial reconnaissance mission on july 31st 1944. it says that in french and again my french is not that good but i understand a little bit of it uh, so this is another commemorative plaque. Look, people really love this guy. Uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupery was, was loved. He was loved by many. And he was loved by many, not only because he was such an adventurer, but also because he wrote this wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. Um, guess what? Even watches are named after him. Even watches. This is a very expensive watch. If you like watches and... Uh, and uh, do you ever want to know? Um, okay. um, if you ever want to know uh, about, uh, if you know about watches, this watch here is worth, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40,000 bucks. And it's named after him. It is actually named after him. So, uh, um, so it's very, very interesting. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of things commemorating him. Uh, let me see, in September, um, in September uh, 1998, to the east of Rio Island, south of Marseille, a fisherman by the name of Jean-Claude Bianco found a silver identity bracelet bearing the names of Saint Exupery, his wife Consuelo, and his American publisher, Reynal and Hickok. The bracelet was hooked to a piece of fabric 
presumably from his flight suit. And they said, oh, wow, that's his bracelet. He's probably down there. That's where his plane is, right? They figured. So let's look at a video. Uh, here we have a video of how of this whole thing. So let's take a peek at this video here, all right? So I heard that if Aaron closed your videos, uh, it will lag less. In 1998, a fisherman named Jean-Claude Bianco was working in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Marseille, France. As a storm approached... Sorry. ...his crew quickly hauled in a trawling net and found an engraved bracelet entangled in it. Upon examining the bracelet, Bianco was startled to see a famous name he immediately recognized so he showed the item to government authorities. They decided that the bracelet probably was a fake, that is, until a scuba diver later told people about an airplane wreck lying at the sea bottom near Bianco's fishing area. The airplane was a Lockheed P-38 Lightning from World War II, and the name on the bracelet was none other than that of the French pilot and author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry known around the world for his children's story entitled, in English, The Little Prince. On June 29, 1900, Antoine-Marie Jean-Baptiste Roger de Saint-Exupéry was born in Lyon, France, into a family with long-established roots in the French aristocracy. One ancestor had fought with the American revolutionaries at the Battle of Yorktown, Virginia, in 1781. Antoine's father, the Viscount Jean de Saint-Exupéry, was an insurance executive who suffered a fatal stroke in 1904. Five years after Jean died, Saint-Exupéry's mother, Marie, moved with her children to the castle of Saint-Maurice de Romain in Le Mans, owned by her mother. Along with his three sisters and one brother, Saint-Exupéry spent his childhood years surrounded by many relatives and the friends of his mother. His early education included the study of literature, drama, and related arts. In 1912, he took his first airplane ride at a small airfield near his grandmother's home. Soon enough, life became much more complicated for the teenaged boy. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary was killed by a Serb assassin. The nations of Europe started aligning themselves in opposing military camps as Austria-Hungary and Serbia waged war against each other. World War I began in earnest on August 1st when Germany declared war on Russia. In spite of the war, Antoine and his brother Francois started attending a Jesuit secondary school near Lyon. As the war grew worse, however, the two brothers retreated to a school in Switzerland where Antoine started writing poetry. In 1917, Francois died of rheumatic fever. In the same year, however, Saint-Exupéry passed his baccalaureate and then sought entrance into the French Naval Academy, but failed the oral part of the entrance test. He then entered the School of Fine Arts in Paris and studied architecture for over a year. In 1921, he started military service in the 2nd Regiment of the French Light Cavalry. He then went to Strasbourg in eastern France for training as a pilot. On July 9th, piloting a Sopwith biplane, he made his first solo flight. In the next year, he earned his pilot's license and was offered a transfer to the air service. And a year after that, the young aviator became engaged to Louise de Villemarin, 
who eventually became a well-known author in her own right. Saint-Exupéry wanted to continue flying, but his fiancée's family objected to his interest in what was, in the 1920s, still a very dangerous activity. Following the family's wishes, he instead settled in Paris, took an office job, and began to write in earnest. Over the next few months, he ran through a series of dissatisfying jobs, and his engagement to Louise ended. In 1926, the editor Adrienne Monnier printed Saint Exubery's first published tale, The Aviator, in her literary magazine. That same year, he returned to flying, this time carrying mail for a private airline company. For three years, he flew the mail over North Africa, escaping deadly airplane accidents several times. He also became director of a remote airfield in the Sahara Desert. The pilot and author's first novel, Southern Mail, appeared in France in 1929, and in the United States four years later. In late 1929, also, Saint Exubery moved to South America and became director of an airmail service in Argentina. Along with him, one of the company's first pilots was the Frenchman Henri Guillaumet. Two other Frenchmen, Jean Mermot and Marcel Rennes, also helped to fly the mail. During his time with the company, Saint Exubery flew both a Lotco Air 25 aircraft and a more advanced version, the Lotco Air 28. Saint Exubery's South American experiences became the basis for his second novel, Night Flight, which appeared in France in 1931. For this novel, he received the Femina Prize, one of France's leading literary awards. The book later appeared in America and became such a bestseller that Hollywood made a film version of the novel starring Lionel Barrymore and Clark Gable. In March of 1931, Saint Exupéry married an Argentinian beauty named Consuelo Carrillo, the widow of Enrique Gomez Carrillo, a Guatemalan diplomat and journalist. She counted among her friends the Nobel Prize winner Maurice Metterling and the Italian novelist, poet, and dramatist Gabriel D'Annunzio. Over the years, the marriage was unsettled. Husband and wife frequently lived apart, as Saint Exubery often was absent on long flights. On July 12, 1934, for example, he started from Marseille for Saigon and returned to the former city ten days later, July 22. In late April of 1935, he went to Moscow to cover the Soviet May Day celebrations for the prominent French newspaper Paris Soir. In December of that same year, he had another aviation accident, this time in Libya. He and his mechanic walked in the desert for three days before being found by a Bedouin caravan. In 1937, Saint Exupéry bought a Cadron Simoun, a brand of airplane he had used while working for Air France in its early years of operation. He had bad luck with this airplane, too. In 1938, he crashed in Guatemala, this time severely injuring himself. While recovering from his injuries, he was encouraged by the French author and his friend, André Gide, to write a book about the piloting profession. In 1939, Saint-Exupéry published Land of Men, a record of his flying adventures, which won a major literary award from the French Academy. That same year, the novel appeared in the United States as Wind, Sand, and Stars, and won the National Book Award. Movie director Jean Renoir talked with Saint Exubery about doing a film version of the novel, but no one came forward to finance the film. In May of 1940, during World War II, France fell to German forces. Saint Exubery joined the Free French Army and made several daring flights, for which he received a major French commendation. 
He eventually escaped from Europe and moved into a new apartment building in New York City, overlooking Central Park. For a few months, he also lived on Long Island's North Shore, where he worked on the small book that would bring him his greatest fame as a writer. During Saint-Exupéry's absence from France, the Vichy regime appointed him to its new national council, but he protested strongly against this supposed honor. He opposed the German occupation, but offered only weak support for the free French leader Charles de Gaulle, and defended himself against criticism of this view by publishing a letter to his countrymen in the New York Times. In 1942, Saint-Exupéry published another book, War Pilot, which told of hopeless flights over German forces when France already was near defeat. That same year, the book was published in America as Flight to Arras. In 1943, he published his best-known work, The Little Prince, in both French and in English. The book did not appear in France until 1945, after the war had ended. The story is a fable for both children and adults. Through the years, it has been translated into over 100 languages and has been called the best-selling book in the world after the Bible and Karl Marx's Das Kapital. According to the Books and Writers website, quote, its narrator is a pilot who has crash-landed in a desert. He meets a boy who turns out to be a prince from another planet. The prince tells about his adventures on Earth and about his precious rose from his planet. He is disappointed when he discovers that roses are common on Earth. A desert fox convinces him that the prince should love his own rare rose and, finding meaning to his life, the prince returns home." Unquote. Unfortunately, Santa Exuberi's actual life did not turn out as happily as that of his fictional boy. After finishing the book, he returned to Europe and joined his old flight squadron. On July 31, 1944, Saint X, as his squadron mates called him, took off from an Allied airstrip in Corsica and headed for southern France. His plane, a Lockheed P-38 reconnaissance aircraft, never returned to base. Various parties speculated that he had been shot down over the Mediterranean, had an in-flight accident, or even committed suicide. The suicide theory grew out of the perception that he had felt isolated in his squadron and seemed pessimistic about the future. On a previous mission, however, he had simply had trouble with his oxygen mask and almost passed out. At his death, Santa Exuberi left behind an unfinished book called La Citadelle. It also appeared in English as The Wisdom of the Sands. He also left behind some notebooks also published after his death. His widow, Consuelo, died in 1979. She is buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. But what in particular caused the pilot author's death? A German fighter pilot from World War II, Horst Rippert, believes he shot down Saint-Exupéry. In modern-day interviews, he has said that before the war, he had read and admired Saint-Exupéry's writings. He also has claimed that he never would have attacked the P-38 if he had known that the author he admired was flying the enemy plane. Interviews with surviving pilots and a lack of German wartime documents, however, raised doubts about Rippert's claim regarding the dogfight. As well, in the year 2000, a diver named Luke Von Rell precisely located the remains of St. Exuberi's plane. Three years later, a salvage team brought to the surface major pieces of the craft. Accident examiners confirmed the plane's identity by its serial number, but the examiners found no bullet holes or other combat damage in the remnants. For most people, therefore, the specific cause of Santa Exupéry's death remains a mystery to this day. So, oh, 
Okay, so now I think we uh, understand a little bit better of uh, what happened. What happened to uh, Antoine de saint Exupery? Probably his uh, oxygen mask didn't work right. And if you don't get enough oxygen, you know, you pass out. So he might have passed out while he was flying and into the water he went. He did not get shot down. Uh, it was an accident. It was an accident that brought him down. But if you recall, the uh, narrator said that he had been in many, many accidents. One in Guatemala, several, several, several means six or seven in the desert, in, you know, in the Sahara Desert. Um, the one when he was racing the plane. So he had been, he had been in quite a few accidents. In fact, I read that uh, they didn't want him to fly uh, combat missions because uh, they felt that uh, he had uh, a lot of problems with uh, bones that have been broken over the years and, and injuries that he had had. So they put him on a reconnaissance flight where he would go and look at enemy troop and then report it back to the camp, you know, to the, to the airport where he was uh, flying from. Uh, they would not allow him to fly combat. The combat was reserved for the younger pilots, pilots that were at least eight years younger than he was. Uh, so the little prince, um, it is nine, let me see, what time is it? It is 9.02. Why don't we take a five minute break? It'll give me a chance to drink a little bit of water and because uh, my mouth gets a little dry when I talk too much. So let's pick it up again in exactly five minutes, which will be 9.07 uh, p.m. Eastern time. 9.07 a.m. China and uh, what uh, that would, would that be like six something or another in uh, in the West Coast. So we'll chat again in about five minutes.
Okay, it's 9.07, so let's uh, get it started. And thank you for allowing me to take a five-minute break. Um, anyway, so there you go. So you've got a little bit of story um, about uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry that tells you about his life, <clears throat> about all the things that he accomplished, all the crashes. We wanted to know how many times he crashed. Well, let me tell you, I'm not exactly sure, but he, he crashed many times. And consequently, he had a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with his body, uh, broken bones and things like that. And for those of you that attended the class on uh, the old man in the sea, and we talked about uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, you also know that Ernest Hemingway uh, in two crashes, he only had two crashes, he wasn't flying, he was a passenger. He was severely injured, which they say might have been the reason why he died, why he committed suicide, because uh, he had problems with his brain. He, he had suffered, uh, his skull cracked. He had a, a cracked skull, and consequently he wasn't able to speak very well and move around very well, and he became very uh, very depressed, and they say that that's the reason why. But anyway, so uh, so the little princess and novella. Remember, I told you at the beginning, a novella, N O V E L L A, um, which is a short novel. Uh, first published in English and in French in the U.S. in April 1943, the story follows a young prince who visits various planets in space, including Earth and addresses themes of loneliness, friendship, love, and loss. You know, these are very deep uh, emotional uh, themes, right? Deep in emotional themes, loneliness, friendship, love, and loss, because he lost a friend, he lost a little prince. Um, at the beginning of the book, if you, if you recall, there's a dedication. And a lot of people, they say, you know, well, what the heck is this all about? Who was Leon Worth? Uh, so he made a dedication to Leon Worth that it reads, I ask the indulgence of the children who may read this book for dedicating it to a grown-up. I have a serious reason. He's the best friend I have in the world. I have another reason. This grown-up understands everything, even books about children. I have a third reason. He lives in France where he's hungry and cold. He needs cheering up. If all these reasons are not enough, I will dedicate the book to the child from whom this grown-up grew. All grown-ups were children once, although few of them remember it. And so I correct my dedication to Leon Worth when he was a little boy. Now, who is Leon Worth? And why is he saying that he lives in France where he is hungry and cold? Why is he saying that? Well, let's, let's find out. Who was Leon Worth? Well, here's Leon Worth. Uh, and he's wearing, I'm not really quite sure. I think this is his uh, first World War uniform. I think Leon Worth uh, served in the army in the French army during First World War. And this might be his, what's called the gala, gala, G-A-L-A, -A, gala uniform. A gala uniform is a uniform you use when you go to a parade or you go to some sort of government function or army function. It's not a uniform that you use when you're fighting, but it's a uniform that you use uh, when you, you, know, you go to a party or something like that. Uh, Leon Worth was a very good friend of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Leon was also an author who lived in France during the Nazi occupation. So if you know your history, uh, when Second World War was declared, you know, England declared war on Germany and then France declared war on Germany, um, the French were run over 
by the Germans. The Germans just defeated the French and they overran Paris. They, they took over. They took over France. And, uh, and he lived there in France at the time. And that's why uh, the Saint Exupery says that he lives in France and he's hungry and cold because when the German soldiers came in, they were very oppressive. They were very bad to the people of France. Uh, on May 10th, 1940, the German army invaded France. Uh, and uh, Leon had to escape Paris since the Nazis were sending Jews to concentration camp. And Leon was a Jew. Leon was a Jew. So he was in danger. Um, the Germans, as you know, every time they invaded a country, one of the first things they did was to gather the Jewish population and they would put them in concentration camps and then eventually kill them. Um, and, uh, and, they would, and they did the same thing in, in France. In France, they took the, the Jewish population that was there and they either put them in ghettos uh, or they took him into concentration camps. So Leon escaped. He left. He left France. But since he was a, an author, he was a writer. And writers, writers write. A writer can't help it. A writer has to write. Has to write about his or her experiences. And he did that. He began to write a diary, uh, which he called Deposition. 1940 to 1944, the secret di diary of life in Vichy, France. Vichy was the government. Uh, the, the, the Nazis, when they came in, they established a government, not the government of France, but their own government. And it was called Vichy, the Vichy government. Don't ask me why they called it the Vichy government. I think it's because it came, it was centered in the town of Vichy. Uh, but anyway, he, by Leon Worth, it was later translated into many different languages. And in this particular diary, he tells a story of when he was in France, how he escaped, how he managed to travel through the countryside, in many cases by riding a bicycle, like it's shown over here. Now that's not Leon Worth, that's someone else. But a lot of people, would ride in bicycles from one city to another. That was the only form of transportation they, they had. And Leon had to hide. He had to hide all throughout this time because if they would have found him and they would have realized that he was Jewish, they would have killed him. They would have killed him. Um, thousands of people were escaping Paris and were experiencing very difficult times. That is why the Saint Exupéry said he lives in France where he's hungry and cold. Many people escape Paris. And uh, there are many pictures going back to those days of people just like this right here, grabbing all the possessions that they have and leaving Paris because the German soldiers had taken over and they were just doing a lot of bad stuff. They were killing people and they were throwing people in jail and they were just oppressing. They were very, it was a very oppressive force. So, uh, and Leon wrote, you know, in his diary, uh, he wrote this one here. This was part of the diary, 33 days. This was 33 days after he escaped by Leon Worth with an introduction uh, by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Um, so he chronicled, he chronicled all of everything, everything that, uh, that happened to him and that he did as he escaped France and went hiding somewhere where he could wait until the end of the war. Um, now let's, let's look at some charming facts about the Little Prince. Let's look about some charming facts about the Little Prince. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, beloved tale of a pilot and a young alien prince has been delighting readers since it was first published in 1943. Even if you know The Little Prince or Le Petit Prince in its original French by heart, 
there are probably a few things you may not know about this particular novella. Saint Exupery knew a thing or two about desert plane crashes. I would say so, having crashed as many times as he did when he depicted the novel's narrator crashing in the Sahara Desert. At the opening of the book, Saint Exupery was writing what he knew. And you know, when we write, we always write about what we know. That's why they say that authors, inside of every book that an author writes, there's a little bit about him or her. Uh, if you're looking about, if you're looking at Oliver Twist, all of the things that happened to Oliver Twist, to some degree, happened to uh, Charles Dickens. Uh, everything that uh, uh, that happened to uh, to Saint Exupery, to the Little Prince, happened to Saint Exupery. So this is very very typical. We always write about the things that we know. Um, was writing uh, he knew. While today he's largely remembered for the Little Prince before World War II, Saint Exupery was celebrated as an aristocratic aviator and writer who had flown mail routes, routes in Africa and South America and even worked as a test pilot. Now, if you know anything about aviation, test pilots have got the most dangerous job that you could possibly imagine. They have a very, very dangerous job. Um, and the reason is that the test pilots are flying planes that there might still be things wrong with it. And their job is to find out those things that need to be improved, that need improvement. And test pilots crash their planes all the time. They crash them all the time. It's a very dangerous job. During an attempt to break the record of the fastest trip between Paris and Saigon, Saint Exupery crashed his plane in the desert. Uh, and uh, 125 miles outside of Cairo, uh, Cairo is the capital of Egypt. The Little Mermaid may have inspired Saint Exupery to write The Little Prince, The Little Mermaid. Uh, he used to always say that he loved that, that, uh, that story. And The Little Mermaid goes back, goes back many years. We, we know The Little Mermaid today from cartoons and movies and things like that. But The Little Mermaid had been around for many years. Uh, Although the true origin of the story is widely debated, debated, one common theory is that Saint Exupery was inspired by this Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. In the early 1940s, Saint Exupery was stuck in a hospital while he dis, uh, recovered from various injuries that he had piled up from his plane crashes. And he was bored out of his mind. His friend, Annabella, decided to read him a story, The Little Mermaid. That got Saint Exupery thinking about writing a fairy tale of his own. So the Little Mermaid might have been the the one that uh, the book that inspired him. And the Little Mermaid, I think, goes back to the 1920s. I think that's when the uh, this little fairy tale was uh, was written. Saint Exupery wrote while in a self-imposed exile in the United States during World War II. Self-imposed exile, meaning that he left the country on his own and he wanted to be away from the Nazi occupation of France. Uh, Saint Exupery had been a pilot in the French Air Force until the German invasion of France in 1940. Saint Exupery refused to join the Royal Air Force and left for the United States instead where he successfully, unsuccessfully tried to get the, uh, let's see, the government to enter the war against Germany. Actually, he went and he, had, he even spoke to, uh, to Roosevelt, to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or at least to one of uh, uh, Roosevelt's uh, uh, assistants. And he said, you gotta enter the war. But back in those days, the United States did not want to enter the war. It was until when Japan invaded uh, Hawaii, uh, Pearl Harbor, that, uh, that the United States entered the war. 
But back then, the United States did not want to enter the war. And uh, they said to him, no, I'm sorry, we, we, we don't want to enter the war right now. But he wanted the United States to enter the war. Uh, Saint Exupery's wife, Consuelo, likely inspired the Princess Rose. Not likely, I know it did, uh, because of all the things that he says, that he left the rose and then he found a lot of roses, you know, in the world. And that meant that after he left his wife back in Argentina, he found that there were many other women just as beautiful as his wife was. And that's what he's really referring to. But then he realized that, well, yeah, there are a lot of other beautiful women, but he loved his rose. He loved Consuelo. And he wanted to go back and be with Consuelo again. Unfortunately, he died of the plane crash, uh, in the plane crash before he was able to do that. Uh, just as Saint Exupery held Consuelo close to his heart, the prince protects his rose, watering her and shielding her from the elements. Although the prince encounters other roses on his journey, the fox reminds him that his rose is unique to him because you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. So basically this is, uh, this is a message in family unity, right? Because he says, hey, you know, that's your rose. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of other roses out there, but that's yours. And you're responsible for her. You're responsible for Consuelo. And that's what he was saying. You know, this book is really about him. And, and he is the narrator, number one, but he's also the little prince. So he's talking about himself. He's talking about himself symbolically in symbols. And in, and in metaphors. This theory is further su supported by the title of Consuelo's autobiography, which is called The Tale of the Rose. Consuelo wrote an autobiography after, after Saint Exupery had died, and, and the title is The Tale of the Rose. So she knew that she was the rose. She knew she was the rose. Saint Exupery both wrote and illustrated The Little Prince. You might not know him, but he did his own illustration. Uh, Saint Exupery himself painted all of the stories, simple watercolors illustrations. He did not consider himself an artist, but he had been a lifelong doodler. Do you know what a doodler is? Someone that makes little doodles. You know, someone that draws little animals and and little buildings and little things like that and was always sketching little people on scraps of paper so whenever he had time and he was writing and he wanted to take a little mental break he would take a little piece of paper and he would draw little things you know we all do that i used i doodled my way through uh through high school and college because i would put, draw little doodles on the side of the note, notebook pad uh, that I was using. I would be listening to the lecture, but at the same time, I would be doodling. doodling. So a lot of people are doodlers. I'm a doodler. And he was a doodler. He had to improvise on some of the illustrations uh, models. Um, Saint Exupery didn't have access to a vast menagerie. Menagerie means a group of animals. Uh, so he based the illustrations on what he could find, pulling inspiration from his own life. He modeled many of the characters from real figures. A friend's poodle became the sheep, while his own pet boxer became the tiger. So he would look at the animal and draw the outline of the animal, but then he would put a tiger's head or he would put a sheep's head on it. Um, and, and that's how he, he was very creative. He was a very creative person. Uh, one of the main characters is never actually shown to the reader. And who is that? Who would that be? Who would that be? Does anybody know? Curiously, the pilot, the narrator, and one of the main characters is never depicted in the book. A, a 2014 exhibit of the Morgan Library and Museum in New York showcased many of St. Exuberi's unpublished drawings, including one depicting the narrator sleeping beside his plane. 
Christine Nelson, curator of the literary and historical manuscripts of the Morgan, share her thoughts on the piece. We can only speculate about why he decided to remove that image. But he was very good at excising, taking away, in other words, what was not essential to the story. A fitting analysis, considering that the story famously says, Le sentiel est invisible pour le you. What is essential is invisible to the eyes. A line that itself went through many revisions. Now, for those of you that attended my class of uh, the old men in the sea, remember that uh, Ernest Hemingway be, uh, believed in the iceberg theory that the majority of the plot, the majority of the story lies under the water, lies beyond the observation of the reader. And it's up to the reader to make up his mind. So he wanted the reader to think of the pilot and decide what kind of a pilot uh, it was. He wanted you, the reader, to create your own narrator, create your own pilot, right? Just like Ernest Hemingway wanted to do all the time. Um, and these are some of the sketches that he himself made. Some of them did not make it into the, uh, into the book. Some of them made it into the book, but slightly modified. But these are some of the sketches and he used uh, simple ink and really washed out watercolors. Um, but you know, as a sketch artist, he was not bad. Look at the hand over here. That hand, you know, hands are usually very difficult to, uh, to draw, but he managed to do a pretty good job. And the tree here, I've seen a lot of people with tattoos of this tree, you know, many, many people with tattoos because this book has influenced people so deeply. Uh, it has influenced people so deeply. Orson Welles wanted to adapt the novella into a film with the help from uh, Walt Disney. Orson Welles, a very famous actor and producer in Hollywood, he's been long dead now. Uh, Welles was apparently so taken with the story that he purchased the film rights the day after reading it. He wanted to work with Walt Disney and even asked Disney to handle the special effects. But the two brilliant artists, you know, him and Walt Disney did not work brilliantly as collaborators. They argued, they argued too much. Disney felt that such a film would upstage his own work and reportedly stormed out of the meeting shouting, there's not room on this lot for two geniuses. Wells' original screenplay was showcased um, during, let me see what it says here, during the Morgan exhibit. Um, St. Exuberis dropped his manuscript off at his friends before rushing off to rejoin the military. And this is how the uh, manuscript after, it, it wasn't published until after he had died. Um, he went to a friend and he said, here, take this manuscript and read it. This is a great story. This is a great uh, novel or a na great novella, read it. Uh, one of the most famous books of all time had an unassuming trip to its publisher. St. Exuberi tossed a rumbled, a rumpled paper bag containing his draft manuscripts and original illustration into a friend's uh, entryway table and immediately took off for France. Again, you know, he went back to fight the war. The 140 page handwritten draft was a mess of struck through prose, illegible handwriting coffee stains, and even cigarette scorch marks. Um, let me see, wait a minute. Um, and even scorch marks. He left it as a parting gift saying, I'd like to give you something splendid, but this is all I have. And it was great. I mean, it, it, it's, it's an incredible story uh, how he, hand wrote the entire book, handwritten 140 pages. And uh, so anyway, let's, uh, we're gonna stop right here. Uh, we have uh, made it to 9.30, we'll pick it up here again next time. But 
we got a, an additional five minutes. Why don't we spend a little time answering some of your questions? Um, does anybody have any questions? Any comments too? Comments are allowed, guys. You can give me comments. Anybody out there? I have another class that I got to leave by. What, what's that? You have another class and you got to leave? Not exactly, but. No, oh, okay. Have. Well, do you have any questions? Uh, speak, well, speak a little louder. Speak a little louder. I, I didn't have any questions, so I'm just going to leave. Okay, so anybody else? Anybody have any questions or any comments? If no, we will shut it down right here. Remember where we left it off and we'll pick it up here next time. So until next time, my dear friends, have a great day. Could I say something? Yo, of course you can. It's like, when, when do we read The Little Prince and Oh, no. we're going to. We're going to read a little bit. We're going to read. I mean, we can't read the whole thing, you know. We don't have time oh. to read uh, everything. But I'm going to read parts of The Little Prince for you. I'm going to read uh, a few pages for you. Now, pretty soon, I think next class, I will be doing that reading. Uh, and then at towards the end of the class, I will read again. I will read the ending of the book. I can't read the whole thing. You know, if I read the whole thing, it will take, you know, much longer than, uh, than the classes allow. It is up to you to read it. Uh, but good question, we will. I will read parts. I will read parts of it. I think about three or four pages. And then the end, towards the end of the class, I will read another three or four pages of the end of the book. That answer your question. Anyone else? Okay, if no questions, we will see you again next time. Bye.